The Lord be with you. All right, y'all, say it with me. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I'm glad to be here, and I hope you are glad to be here, and I'm glad to welcome all of those who are with us online this morning. Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. It is just a joy to be in the house of the Lord with God's people uh, today. Uh, this is World Communion Sunday. We have communion first Sunday of every month, but all over the globe. Christians in every church in the globe will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so I want you to be thinking about that as you partake of the body and blood of Christ. I want you to be thinking about your brothers and sisters around the world who are doing the very same thing and how we are to be reminded that we are one body in the Spirit through the Lord. It is such a great and glorious thing. Uh, just a couple of uh, in-house uh, personnel announcements. Um, our longtime secretary and bookkeeper, Bridget Dechamendi, will be leaving us. Uh, you may know her husband, Luke, has a wonderful roofing business. Uh, he did the roof for the church, and I can highly recommend his company. But she's also the secretary and bookkeeper for him, and his business has exploded in the last year or so. It's doubled, and she cannot do both jobs effectively. And so she has regretfully uh, given us her... Uh, her notice and we will be looking to replace her but we will be wishing her and her family well. Uh, you'll know they had a small fire in the laundry room at their house this week. Uh, I'm not saying those two things are connected but uh, <coughs> but they're all fine. Nobody was injured and they're cleaning up uh, after all of that. Uh, and the second thing, y'all know, and we've talked about this before, but our beloved Jim Elder has been doing the audio-visual work for this since we began doing online worship, and he's done an outstanding job, has set up our system, and has uh, developed some training videos and whatnot. But with uh, Jim's input and advice, we have elected to look for someone to do this job. We've, it'll be a paid position, a couple hours on Sunday morning, and then whatever time it takes to get everything posted. Uh, so we'll be posting that job, but if you know of somebody who would be interested, please let me know. And I want to say again, and I hope you will join me in giving a big thank you to Jim Elder for all his wonderful work. <laughs> of course, Kathy is right there at his elbow, reminding him what he's forgotten. And uh, so, Kathy, we thank you uh, as well. Uh, don't forget our Wednesday prayer gra gathering at 10 o'clock out in the Augusta Community Prayer Garden. And I will tell you, this is a wonderful time of year to be outside at 10 o'clock. So if you can be here for that, bring a lawn chair, bring your mask, and we sit outside and have a good time of, of prayer and scripture reading and fellowship. Will you join me now in our invitation to worship from Psalm 25? Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Let us pray. Righteous and holy God, give us the strength this day that we may walk your straight path and to not be led astray by the masses that refuse to hear your voice or live according to your will. Thank you that in Christ we have been saved by grace and have an eternal inheritance kept for us in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is Psalm number 1, and it is set to the tune of Abide With Me. So I believe the words are self-explanatory, and I believe the tune is as well. So thank you, Ms. Bill. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
Will you join me now in our prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with all our heart and mind and strength and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, transform what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are truly, truly forgiven. Amen. We have a lot to be in prayer about today. Uh, please continue to pray fervently for our sister Sheila Tucker, who had an MRI recently, and it looks like cancer may have returned to her liver. You know, she was treated for that a while back, and it had resolved, and they've been working on her because she's had some spots on her lungs, and it looks like it may have returned to her liver. They're not certain, and we'll be doing another MRI this week. But, you know, she just lost her daughter uh, two weeks ago, so this is a very hard time for her, and I ask you to lift her up and encourage her and see how we might come alongside her in this time of, of great trial. Continue in prayer for Ann Jones, uh, Bill and Carolyn Lee's daughter. She successfully went through her first four or five days of treatment at the hospital for her leukemia and is now going to embark on a rigorous in and out uh, two or three time a week episode where there'll be uh, infusions and, and other things that'll go on and it'll be almost a two-year process that she is embarking on. So pray for her and for Jacob and for their four children and for their whole family. Uh, continue to pray for Lewis Pounds, who's dealing with blood clots in his lungs. Now, he had been scheduled to have eye surgery the first week or two of this month. He is going to be able to have it on Wednesday. All right. Um, that's the blood for him to be there as far as it is. Okay. So Lewis will be having eye surgery on Wednesday, so please keep him uh, in your prayers. Continue to pray for Bill Trammell, who, as you know, has been struggling with a number of health issues. He's, he's eating and he's walking a little bit, but it is still a huge trial for Janice and for Mark uh, at home. So please keep them in your prayers. Debbie Long had successful knee replacement surgery this week. It was only partial, and so they didn't have to cut on as much as they thought they were going to, and that's a good thing. She's recovering well. Uh, but Tracy's been looking after her, and I appreciate your concern for her. Uh, Debbie's sister, Susan, uh, let her know that uh, Susan's son, Christopher, her only child, died of a drug overdose uh, this week. This is evidently something he had struggled with for years, and it finally took him. And uh, this is just a terrible time for that family. So I ask you to lift them all up uh, in prayer. Uh, be in prayer for Gingy Walcott's friend, Michelle Wayman. Her sister was a postal carrier, and she was crossing the street to deliver some mail and was hit by a driver who took off and her sister was killed. Um, I don't know if they've apprehended the person responsible or not, but that's a terrible thing uh, for them. Uh, as you know, Pete Hetherington had wanted us to be in prayer for a coworker that he knows, a young woman who she and her husband were wrestling over the decision about whether or not to have an abortion. And they've been going back and forth about it and the family keeps changing their mind and they are, they're just all torn up as anybody would be and I don't know what the final outcome is, but I want you to know that God's grace abounds for everybody uh, on all sides of this. But just be in prayer that God's mercy and love would be known throughout all of that. And we also need to be in prayer for our president. <clears throat> I'm appalled, quite frankly, at the number of people who are rejoicing over this turn of events. And whatever you think of the man and his policies, and he's certainly not perfect, and I don't know anybody here that would claim that they are. He is our president. And we don't want our enemies to think for a minute that this is not a country that is united in spirit behind uh, the goal of making this a good place for all. And that's his job. And you can argue all day long about what kind of job he's doing. But we are commanded in Scripture to pray for those who are over us and to seek their well-being that they might seek God's will 
for their lives and for the life of this country. And we should be always praying fervently for all those who are in leadership over us. And I want to mention one more thing. If the President of the United States can get COVID-19, so can any one of us. There is no one that this disease has declared as exempt from its uh, trepidations. And so we need to be in prayer for the families of the over 200,000 in this country and the hundreds of thousands more around the world who have passed away, for the families that are wrestling with people who are, have this thing, and for those who are striving to find some kind of vaccine or cure. We pray fervently for the people on the front lines, uh, caring for folks day in and day out. Uh, and we just don't hear all the horror stories, but I know there are plenty of them. This is a terrible thing, but it ought to make all of us stop and pause and think, if this took me today or next week, what would I have wanted to spend my time doing? How would I have wanted to treat other people? What would I want people to be saying about me when I'm gone? Those are, nobody wants to think about that stuff. But honestly, in between COVID and the hurricanes and the wildfires and the murder hornets and all the rest of it, if you haven't been thinking about it, something's wrong with you. And we come together as the people of God who are not afraid because we know that Jesus Christ rules over all things. And he is not surprised by either the virus or the hornets or the hurricanes or anything else. And it's all under the Lord's control. Remember that and take heart as we go to God now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are gathered before you this day to praise your name and to glorify you for what you have done for us through the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that this is your world and that your will is working itself out. And we ask you to remind us of that, especially on those days where it's hard to see where your will is at work. Father, we confess that we are beset with many, many trials, and we hear about everything in the world, thanks to our modern communication systems. So we feel besieged, Father, by the troubles of the world. And our hearts are pained, and we are weighed down. And we confess that there are days where we wonder, are you really paying attention to what's going on? Your people are hurting, this world is broken, and there is so much pain and suffering that many are struggling to see your goodness and to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who are struggling. We pray for those who are suffering not only in body, but especially in spirit, as they seek to discover where your love and mercy might be found. Help us, Father, to be the people who point to the cross of Christ, as we can affirm boldly that even in our deepest and darkest nights, that even in our most painful moments, you are not only there, but you have taken all of that suffering upon yourself in Christ at the cross so that we might be free from fear, so that we might know that Jesus walked every dark path for us so that even when we falter, his faithfulness is counted to our credit. We do not deserve that kind of love, Father, and yet you have poured it out on us abundantly. We ask you to show us how to live as people who believe in hope, who believe in your goodness and who, above all, share your love with others, regardless of what we think of them or what they think of us, regardless of how we are treated. Show us what real love looks like, not warm and fuzzy feelings, but genuine sacrifice, pouring ourselves out and serving others from a position of humility because we know that we have achieved nothing on our own and it is all by your grace alone. We thank you for loving us that much. 
We do pray this day, Father, for the president and for those in his circle who've come down with this virus. We pray that they would be healed and we pray that they would seek your will, that they would walk in ways that are pleasing to you, that they would lead this country in a way that is pleasing to you. May we all do so. May we all remember that you are Lord over every king, every president, every prime minister, every mayor, and every city councilman, that there is no authority on earth except that which has come by your hand. Show us how to submit gracefully as we struggle with the fallenness of the world and including the fallenness of those who are set in leadership over us. God, we recognize that we cannot rule ourselves, much less rule over anyone else. So we ask you, Father, in Jesus Christ to rule over us. Rule through your Holy Spirit, rule through your word, and rule above all in love that the people who know us would catch a glimpse of this wonderful kingdom that you have made possible for us and that we would live as citizens of that kingdom first and foremost, sharing that love with the world for the sake of our Savior, Jesus, in whose name we pray, praying as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Micah, uh, from the fourth chapter, the first five verses. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. 
For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And the New Testament reading is from the 7th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th and 14th verses. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit now upon us. Enlighten our eyes and give vision to our hearts and unite our spirit with you that we might truly hear your word this day, that it might take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives that is pleasing to you for Christ's sake. And now may the words of my mouth And the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Jesus is now winding up this glorious message that we all know as the Sermon on the Mount. And being the model preacher that he is, uh, he is giving his audience something to follow up on, something to enact in their own lives. And we should always remember this about anything that Jesus says. He is not giving us, he is not preaching, he is not teaching just for information. He's not giving us information, but he is seeking our transformation. And so he's drawing a bright line in the sand that will call for a decision, a choice, a commitment. And what also to me is very refreshing about Jesus is that he does not sugarcoat things out of fear of offending people. He doesn't tap dance around the hard parts of his message. And in fact, if we're going to tell the truth, and we should have figured this out by now, the entire message of Jesus Christ is actually hard. And it does not, he does not pander to people by pretending that it is not. Now, you know, just before this, he's given us the golden rule which is do what? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that is a perfect summation of everything he's already taught in this sermon. And we need to constantly bear in mind that this incredible sermon, uh, unlike what so many people think, is not a set of instructions on how to live. The Sermon on the Mount is not something to be admired, and it's not even something, if you can hear this, it's not even something to be imitated. The sermon describes what life is like for the people who have already entered into it, for the people who have been empowered to be citizens of this kingdom and whose lives are infused with the Holy Spirit, which is given to those who have entered this kingdom and become citizens. And you will know who these people are. You can spot them instantly because they live by what? The golden rule. This is the way they live. And so the converse is also true. When you see people not living that way, it is appropriate to question, even though we don't know someone's heart and that's God's business and not ours, it is appropriate to question whether or not they have actually grasped grasped the message of Jesus Christ. The golden rule is another way of framing the central commandment of the kingdom. Love one another as you have been loved in Christ. Everybody knows that verse from 1 John chapter 4, 19. We love because what? He first loved us. We love because he first loved us. And I'll tell you the truth. This kind of love is not natural <laughs> for fallen human beings. Amen? It is not natural at all. And it is only because we have been loved first 
in Jesus Christ. That we can even begin to love others in a godly way. But that is God's purpose for us, and ultimately it is his great pleasure in us. So Jesus presents us now with two gates and two ways. A wide gate and an easy way and a narrow gate and a hard way. One direction leads to destruction and the other leads to life. And I know not everybody's going to get this reference and I apologize for that. But for fans of the rock groups, uh, Led Zeppelin and ACDC, you'll note that there is only a stairway to heaven, but there is a highway to hell. And there's a clear echo here of the words that God uttered by the mouth of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning at the 13th verse. He said, See, I have set before you life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. But here's where we have to be careful. Because we hear about these two gates and these two paths, the easy and the hard, and we tend to think that Jesus is talking about the difference between living as good people and living as bad people. Because we know good people go to heaven, right? And bad people go to hell. Good people don't drink or swear. They don't get divorced. They don't have tattoos. And above all, they go to church. And they know how to quote scripture. Bad people, on the other hand, do all those awful things and a whole host of sinful stuff that we don't even have time to catalog. But we know who they are. We can spot them. Oh, sinners are just out there everywhere. And, of course, the easiest way to pick them out is they're never where? In church. And this is where we miss The stark truth that Jesus is pointing out, it is not a question of good versus evil or even religious or non-religious. In fact, there are only two categories of people in the world. Hear me now. And the dividing line is between true religion and false religion. Now, I know that some are going to say, hold on. Stop. I am not religious at all. You're not talking about me, so count me out of your judgmental categories. I beg to differ because I tell you the truth, everybody practices some religion, whether you call it organized or not. Religion is how you describe that system of thought that you have framed up in your head, some belief that gives your life meaning and purpose. And if you say you have no belief, well, to believe that there is nothing to believe is itself a statement of faith. And everybody has a code of ethics that flows from their system of belief. Even the most godless pagan who practices nothing but pleasure and anarchy is operating out of his belief system and, in truth, practicing his religion. And the most dangerous religion of all is the one that tells you you can get right with God or be one with the universe, however you want to frame it, through your own efforts through your own will and through your own character. Do you realize that it was the most religious people on earth who had Jesus crucified? The scribes and the Pharisees and the rulers of the temple in Jerusalem had taken the life-giving and life-guarding Word of God and had turned it and twisted it into shackles and chains that kept people from discovering the love and the grace and the mercy of God. All through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has repeated this phrase, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. He was having to rearrange their thinking, helping them to unlearn what they had learned. Uh, You might know this, but the Pharisees had tallied it up and discovered that there are 613 commandments, statutes, rules, and regulations in the Old Testament. And they felt that to be faithful, you had to be in compliance with every last one of them every single day. Everybody. That's exhausting to try and keep up with that, isn't it? They set people on this terrible and grim hamster wheel 
of self-effort, always striving and always, always, always falling short. And here is the truth. Apart from faith in Jesus Christ, that God-forsaken hamster wheel is the operating mechanism of every belief system in the world, whether people want to call it religion or not. There are only two gates leading to only two paths, which are two religions. The religion of works versus the religion of grace. The religion of self versus the religion of self-denial. The religion of the flesh versus the religion of faith. And the religion that is based on your own goodness and righteousness versus the religion that is based on the true and authentic goodness and righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. The point is this, and you have heard it before, but I want you to hear it a thousand times more. Jesus did not come and die and rise again to turn bad people into good people. He came to bring dead people to life. And the goodness that flows out of them from that point is the evidence that they are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, what's he talking about? Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can stand in some neutral place, standing in front of both gates before both paths and trying to make your mind up. To put this more accurately, I think, is we all start out on that wide path, don't we? The path of self-reliance, the path of self-actualization, the path of self-righteousness. And in order to get to the narrow gate, we've got to admit that we've been going the wrong way, and so we have to do what? Turn around and go the other way, which feels like we're not going forward anymore. Y'all know that old joke about Moses, right? Why, he had, why the Israelites had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness? Because Moses was a man, and he won't stop and ask directions. Well, I got news for you, ladies. That's true for you as well. It's true for all of us. None of us want to admit we've been going the wrong way, especially when it was our way. Oh, my gosh. So what is the biblical word for turning around and going in the other direction? What? Speak up. Repentance. Repentance. All right, I'm going to say that question again, and everybody's going to give me the answer. <laughs> What is the biblical word for turning around and going in another direction? Repentance. In Hebrew, I'm telling you the truth, in Hebrew it is actually an agricultural term that describes what happens when a farmer is plowing his field and he gets down to the end of a row and has to turn the oxen around and go the other way. It is literally turning and going in another direction. We think of repentance as what? Feeling bad. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm just mortified at what I have done. And you know what? If we truly understand who God is <laughs> and who we are, we ought to feel bad. We ought to feel bad just reflecting on that. But just feeling bad is not nearly enough. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Oh, what a beautiful phrase. Whereas worldly grief produces death. And you'll remember that as Jesus first began his ministry, the first words he spoke were these. It's in Mark's gospel, the first chapter, the 15th verse. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what is it we have to repent from? Is it from being bad people? No. We need to repent from relying on our own self-righteousness. Now, if you're being a bad person, you probably ought to shape up, but... You need to repent from thinking that you're okay with God as long as you're doing better than other people. We need to repent from anything that interferes with humbling ourselves and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We have to realize that Jesus himself, Jesus himself is the narrow gate. And he offers us a hard way. John 14, 6. I know you all know this. I am the way and the truth, and the life. And apart from our union with Christ through the Holy Spirit, we will be walking the wrong way, walking in a lie, and walking straight towards death and destruction. There are only two gates and two ways. And this is exactly what Micah is referring to. For all the people walk in the name of their God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. 
Now, the world says that for anybody to say that there is only one way is judgmental and arrogant. And all I can say to that is I didn't say it, Jesus did. And I don't think that he was misguided or <laughs> misquoted. You might have heard this before, but C.S. Lewis famously wrote, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the same level as a man who says that he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something much worse. Let's not have any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. This gate is so narrow, in fact, that there are some things that will not fit through it with us. We have to leave behind the ways of the world. In the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and persecute those. Pray for those who persecute you. About got that wrong. So that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. And you know what? Those who hate their enemies show which gate they have entered through and which way they are walking. We have to leave ourselves behind. And that's what Jesus meant at the beginning of this sermon when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit means we no longer put our trust in our own selves, in our own goodness, our own righteousness. To be poor in spirit means to repent of self-reliance so that we can embrace the gift of grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. And we also have to leave behind the idea that the way of Christ is easy. I tell you, there are a lot of folks that think that once they belong to Christ and get into this kingdom and they experience perhaps that euphoria that comes in that first moment of faith, I think this is amazing, this is awesome, and it's just going to be one straight, happy, unbroken line, straight on to heaven. No, ma'am, no, sir. I think, frankly, it's more like if you've ever been to Disney World and you've been on Space Mountain. You know, you're completely enclosed in the dark on this roller coaster that feels like it's going about 200 miles an hour. You cannot see where you are going. You cannot see what is around you. And you're praying to God that the person who put the thing together knew what he was doing. <laughs> that is the hard way. You have to trust that this Jesus who's buckled you into this thing knows what he is doing. We have to leave behind the idea that this is going to be an easy path, which is why we have to do this together. You cannot do this alone, and God does not intend for us to do it alone. Yes, Jesus says his way is easy, and his, burden, his yoke is easy, and his burden is light, but he is referring to the fact that we've gotten rid of all that rule-keeping that the Pharisees were so fond of. The path, however, is exceedingly hard. Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 14, whoever do not, does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether you have enough to complete it? So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you might remember, was the Lutheran pastor who was executed by the Nazis for his resistance to them. And he wrote these words. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. And you just don't see that in a lot of church advertising, do you? Come and die. But that is what we are calling people to do because that is what Christ has called us to do. This gate is narrow and the way is hard. But the good news is that Jesus has opened that gate for us and has shown us the way. He is the gate and he is the way. So I just have to ask you this morning, I have to do a check every now and again. Have you entered by the narrow gate or are you still wandering on that wide path? Have you trusted in Christ for all of this stuff or are you still clinging to your own self-righteousness? Let it go. It's way too heavy. Walk this hard and narrow path with Jesus who will never leave us or forsake us. I want to leave you with the words from a poem by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a wood, 
And I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we come to this table today because Jesus has opened that gate for us and because he is the way. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He is the one that has given us union with God our Father and with one another. And those are gifts that can never be taken away. So you will remember that on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my own blood, which is poured out for your sins. Take and drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we know that we have no standing before you except through Christ our Savior. We know that these are gifts far beyond anything that we could ask, and yet you have graced us with them through your great love for us. So we ask you now, Father, Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine and upon us that this might be a true communion in the body and blood of our Savior. That being nourished by this spiritual food, we might be empowered to walk the narrow way in a way that pleases you and that we might invite others to come join us. Be with us now. Celebrate with us now. Show us your love in this moment for Christ's sake. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst again. And I remind you, this is not the table of the Presbyterian Church, but the table of the Lord. And to this table, he invites all who truly repent of their sins and seek to live in newness of life with God and with one another. If that's you, then this is your place, the gifts of God for the people of God. the body of Christ.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Okay, thank you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have brought us to your banqueting table, and your banner over us is love. And what can we say but thank you? Grant, Father, that our gratitude would be seen not merely in our words, but in the way that we live, the narrow way, the hard way, the way of our Savior Christ. Be with us through it all, and grant us that abundant life which is ours in him. And we ask it all in his name. Amen. Before we affirm our faith, I just want to remind you that there is a box out in the narthex in case you feel the need to make a contribution to the church. We would be very grateful for your support. Or you can make a donation online through our website or use snail mail, uh, whatever suits you best. Will you stand in body or spirit as we affirm what it is that we believe by responding to the first question from the Heidelberg Catechism? What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Our closing hymn, and you may be seated, is just a closer walk with thee. He has showed you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love mercy, 
and walk humbly with your God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.